Hello, and welcome to Why We Write. I'm your host, Randall Beyer. My guest today is Dr. Stuart Tubbs, Daryl H. Cooper Professor of Leadership and former Dean of the College of Business here at Eastern Michigan University. He also serves as a visiting professor of leadership in the Executive MBA program at Coach University in Istanbul, Turkey. Professor Tubbs' teaching and research interests cover a wide range of topics affecting leadership and managerial communication, as well as issues of gender, the place of spirituality in business, and organizational effectiveness. He is the author of two best-selling textbooks, A Systems Approach to Small Group Interaction, now in its 10th edition, and with co-author Sylvia Moss, Human Communication, now in its 11th, which has also been published in China. He is the author of over 50 articles and professional papers published in such publications as Industry Week, The Management Review, The Journal of Communication, and Journal of Leadership Studies. His Keys to Leadership 101 Tips for Success was published this year by McGraw-Hill. Dr. Tubbs has been recognized as an outstanding teacher numerous times. His teaching extends beyond the classroom to the boardroom of high performance organizations as well through his training organization, which you can visit on the web at theproductivityinstitute.com. Stu, welcome to Why We Write. Thank you, Randy. Nice to be here. Well, as we've uh, talked about on the phone and, and, and rehearsed a little bit, uh, I always ask you know, the person who's here with me why they write. So I, I'll put that to you. Why do you write? Well, the thing that I like is to always watch for current events. And there's always something that's going on every day mm -hmm. in the world. And what happens is I get ideas from these things, and I want to try to share it with others. And it's a form, it's an extension of the classroom is the way I look at it. It's just another way of teaching. Mm -hmm. Is this something that uh, you kind of have always, have always done through, throughout your professional career? That well, kind of I started uh, literally 40 years ago tomorrow uh, in doing this. Thank you. And uh, I started writing my first book within the first two months mm -hmm. after that. And now that book is coming out in the 12th edition this coming January, and uh, so I really have been doing it all my career, but I think the most fun part was the 12 years that I wrote a newspaper column in Ann Arbor, and because um, that was short, it was quick, it was a fast turnaround, and it was very timely. You know, textbooks have about a year turnaround. Right, right. It's harder to, to be as timely. Well, that might be a good segue, because uh, that question was going to come up in the, in the body of our discussion, but what is it about writing for the academic audience or for the uh, professional audience, a, a book, uh, a long publication, as opposed to uh, that, like a column, or I, I know that you've uh, responded to blogs and things right. of that nature. What's the well, difference? Well, the column is very short. It's usually about 500 words, mm -hmm. and you ought to be able to read it in like five to 10 minutes. And actually, I kind of like writing that way, and I think more and more students tell me they like that kind of writing. So actually, my one leadership book is made up of 101 of my, what I think are my best leadership columns, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because people, students literally, one wrote in an uh, evaluation recently, he said it's like reading a novel. Uh, whereas the, the other textbooks that are more traditional, I think are more uh, in depth, but they're a lot more, um, I, I think a little more difficult reading. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so uh, I kind of, uh, over my career, I've gravitated more toward the more popular kind of writing. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Tell us something about, about leadership as a, as a field of study and as a, as a profession. Well, the first thing is that people say, is this something that you can learn or is it something you're born with? Mm -hmm. And then you have to get into the definition of what is leadership, and I simply define it as influencing others. Mm -hmm. Influencing others to, to accomplish organizational goals. And so if you just boil it down to influencing others, then the question becomes, how do you do that? And then I go into like, there are 10 main ways that you can influence others. So we work on developing those skills that are learnable. And we spend over $50 billion a year in this country on leadership development training okay. over and above university training, yeah. over and above right. uh, formal education. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's a big need in our country. Uh, it, it, certainly written communication is important, but is that what really is, the, is that a major aspect of leadership, or is there something, something else? I think else? It, uh, it, it covers the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the literature shows that the vast majority of our time we spend listening each day, 
And then the second best is, is uh, the second most often thing that we do is, is talking. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things we do the most often. But you also have to read, reach wider audiences, and that's when the written word comes into play. For example, as a uh, uh, corporate communicator, I worked for General Motors for the first 15 years of my career, mm -hmm. and I worked on the co corporate communication staff at General Motors. So one of the projects that I had was when they were merging AC spark plug with uh, Rochester products in uh, Rochester, New York, mm -hmm. and there were 14,000 people here and 14 here, 14,000. So they merged these two divisions of 28,000 people. So we had to develop a very extensive communication plan to try to get the word out as quickly as possible in the proper sequence because you don't want the employees reading it in the That's newspaper. Right. That's right. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> there's where you had lot. to combine this comprehensive plan with oral and written communication both. Right, and you had to sort of deliver the, the written product in, in stages, as, yes. as, as you point out. Well, yeah. and the other thing is that a lot of, uh, especially college students, aren't familiar with what they call press kits, and that is if you're making a major speech, you always provide the, the, the transcript of the speech to the media, because otherwise, you know, they're trying to write down things, they're trying to listen to, you know, they can't get it no, all right. right. And so right. you do that to make sure that you have fidelity of the, uh, the message. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, in fact, the, uh, the Obama campaign apparently it was a master yes. at this. The, well, let me just give you a quick rundown on situational leadership. Yes. If you want to, you can simplify it into just sort of two categories. And that is when someone comes to you and you're in a leadership role, the first thing you can do is just say, is this something that they basically haven't got a clue and I really need to help guide them? Mm -hmm. Or are they pretty experienced and I need to help draw them into the answer because they probably have a pretty good chance of knowing it themselves? So the first group is called coaching and the second response would be called counseling. In the coaching category, it's where you know the answer and they don't. And so that's where you can get to be directed. Well, as it turns out, it, it is autocratic, but it meets the need of the person who doesn't have a clue. They say, right. well, kind what of is it you expect me to do? Mm. I'm new on the job. I want to succeed. What do you expect of me? Mm -hmm. And the Gallup poll has surveyed over a million people worldwide, and they find out that's the number one question that employees want from their leaders is tell me what you want me to do, what are, what are the expectations? I can do a number of things. I have skills, but I need to know where you what want What do you want me to do to be successful? Do, right. do you want me to be a self-starter, or do you want me to make sure I check everything with you first? Right. So, so that's, that's the, the coaching style. Right. Now, the counseling side is when someone who's more mature comes to you and says, you know, I'm struggling with something. I, I'd appreciate your advice on something. So then the, the, you change, instead of telling them, do this, do this, do this, you start asking them, well, what would you be comfortable with? Well, what have you tried? What was the result? How did it make you feel? And by right. using this series of questions, you then, with them, guide them into an answer that they're willing to go out and try. Right, so it's so a that's more a dialogical, much, dialogical yeah, This process. is much more of a kind of what I would mm. call a soft touch. Mm. This is the more kind of firm fist. Right. And so that's kind of what situational leadership breaks down into. Would, is situational leadership, situational leadership a, a trope, so to speak, in leader, leadership studies now, management studies? Tell me what you mean by trope. Well, a trope is a kind of a repeating motif or something that's, that has a kind of, um, a, a major influence in terms across a wide range of, uh, oh, yes, of studies. Yes. I mean, it's something, in, in, it comes from, say, literature where you, maybe you're reading a poem or a book and you keep coming back to the same kind of right. motif. Um, well, yes, and, and that reminds me of one of my favorite things is you were talking about things that are sort of fads mm -hmm. and buzzwords and things like that. One mm -hmm. of the things that I teach in my classes are some of where these ideas have come from. For example, uh, influence and persuasion comes from 300 uh, BC from Aristotle. And some of the things that we, we learn about leadership go all the way back to uh, uh, Egypt 5,000 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, these are enduring concepts Certainly. and enduring tropes, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the one most recently is uh, Governor Mark Sanford, you know, South Carolina has just been involved in sure. this scandal and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And everybody's talking about what is it that causes people to do that in public life? And the idea that comes up is hubris. Again, this is a concept that is centuries old. It does go back to Thousands the of to years old from the Greeks. Oedipus, yeah. And uh, yes, That's and, right. and so anyway, what I try to do is to show the consistency of these ideas and these reoccurring themes that uh, aren't just the, the flavor of the month, 
that are going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Yeah, right. You gave a presentation once to a group of faculty here on how to kind of pull a writing agenda together mm -hmm. for their for their career career uh, training. Uh, in terms of your research and uh, so how you translate this experience into um, into the written word, how how do you actually go about thinking about that or structuring that or pro well, processing I, it? What I do is I have somebody actually take notes and transcribe as much as possible mm -hmm. my lectures. No and then I look okay. at them in sort of outline form and they usually are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it does begin to give you a structure. You know, it's yeah. like, okay, well this one's going to be on situational right. leadership. This is going to be the 10 influence, influence stuff. Uh, strategies and so on and then mm -hmm. they sort of break down into chapters that way mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it begins to give you the structure and, and I've been told by publishers that this is the way most uh, professors begin to write books is you take your material that you've been teaching right and then you just simply commit it to writing and then of course you have to do an awful lot of polishing sure because, because you're going from a spoken mode yes. and kind of an idea mode right. to the sort of polished word the other thing I would just add, and that is the best advice I ever saw, and it was a book, I think it was called Strunk and White or something like that, uh, a writing book, and they said, don't edit yourself, just get something on paper, just write something, you can always go back and improve it later. Right, right. And it's the same idea as in, in groups, it's called brainstorming. Uh, no criticism. That's a nice association. No yeah. criticism. The wilder of the ideas, the better. Try to get as much volume as you can, and then you go back at a later date, and then you try to cut right. out. Right. That's a very. That's a nice point. I hadn't quite thought of that as brainstorming, but uh, it certainly is, and uh, that is a personal block for me. It takes me so long to get anything because I just want it to be perfect when right. it comes out, and it's right. really the wrong approach. It always works works against me. I went to a conference recently where uh, it was um, a conference of uh, uh, sort of uh, business and special librarians. Uh, people but think they think a lot about information in an organization. This particular group is very organizationally focused. Mm -hmm. And they talked, they had one section, which was kind of odd. They had a section called the unconference, where th the rules are um, anyone who attends is the right group of people. It starts when, it, when, when things get started is the right time. And the agenda is written by those who show up. Mm -hmm. And they have a few thought-provoking things to start off with. And this was about, for instance, how could a small library in a big organization uh, have presence in mm -hmm. the organization and actually not be hidden, and things of that nature, and personal, personal uh, career type training. But uh, the unconference format was really interesting because universally people seem to say, well, you know, this is just a chance to say whatever comes to mind without necessarily making it the right thing. And so right. they went through this kind of, I guess you'd say it was a brainstorming kind of sure. process. I mean, I don't know where it's going to go. But well, what that does is it reminds me of the idea of the formal organization and the informal organization. Mm -hmm. Every organization has a structure and boxes and who reports to whom right, and that right, sort of thing. Right. But what happens is sometimes it's the informal organization that gets things done. You have to break through. Like uh, finding this place today, I, I happened to run into somebody in the hallway and I said, do you know who Randy Byer is? And they said, oh yeah, he's the librarian. So you have to go up to the library right. people to ask where he is. The people down here didn't know who you were because you weren't in their section. I wasn't in so their that, section. You're not in that formal box of the formal organization. Right. It was the informal organization. They said, oh yeah, I do this to that. That was what got, got it done. And that's true in virtually every organization. Now, I was just reading an article recently in Fortune magazine about General Motors and why it had so many problems. And part of the problem was they kept reorganizing so often that the formal organization had to run things and all the informal connections got broken. They kept getting broken. They kept yeah. getting broken mm -hmm. and so things couldn't get done because you didn't know who's that person to call when I really need something fast. Right. Somebody else is, is there now. Right. And so how, the how unconference is like the informal organization. You don't have to follow the rules. You can just do whatever uh, it takes. Right. Yeah. Now, the, actually, the, uh, the writing process in this was, was uh, it wasn't anything special. I mean, we've all done this. It was a, a matter of capturing ideas quickly. Somebody else would write them up on a, a wiki space, so mm -hmm. a, a publicly available website that anyone can comment on. 
And then progressively over a week or so with some comments, there was kind of a, uh, I don't know, an executive summary put right. up about what the, the discussion happened. Do you know where um, wiki comes from? Well, I know it's a, it's a Hawaiian word that means, it means fast quick. or quick, yeah. right? Wiki, which wiki seems means quick, quick. Quick, quick in, in Hawaiian. Um, like Wikipedia. Is, is, do you think this kind of writing is effective in the kind of, kind of high-powered major organizations that you, that you work with? I mean, is well, it something that has an effect? It goes back to the, uh, the uh, situational leadership model. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of what you're trying to do, and that is like entrepreneurial, innovative things that are creating new ground, then the informal is probably the most likely to be effective. Before that ever gets communicated to the public, you know, the stakeholders, the stockholders, the yes, clients. Right. And the official language. So then it's got to be formalized. Yeah, really, yeah. So right. it just depends on the situation, depends on the audience, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the reasons that Twitter has become so popular, it's extremely informal, uh, but it's very fast and very brief. And so, you know, that has filled a niche that we didn't have even two years ago. It's it didn't true. Even exist. It, uh, it works so differently than um, sort of live chat, which uh, requires the, the, the actual, the, the same placement of people at a computer or at right. some kind of, to sort of wilf, willfully go in a conversation right. together. This synchronous is, versus asynchronous. And asynchronous. This is, this is almost synchronous because it's so fast, it's right. just happening, but actually it's it technically asynchronous. You, you're well, a, let me give you another example mm. of that. The guy named Reed Hastings, uh, was, he, was, he had a, a movie, it was uh, Apollo 13, mm -hmm. and he had had it out, checked out from Blockbuster Video. He went back and it was a $75 late fee. He was enraged and he was so mad, he says, okay, I'm gonna go over to the, the gym and work out. So he goes over to this Bally's or something like that and he's working out and he's punching a punching bag and then all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute now, why do you have to have this structured thing? And so he came up with a whole new company called Netflix mm -hmm. where you pay once a month and you get unlimited time like the Bally's gym. So he took the Bally's gym model and applied it to the Blockbuster business and created Netflix, which is now many times bigger than Blockbuster. And he got so, that idea working out his frustration. <laughs> working out his frustration. So you see, this was an informal yeah. uh, concept, right. but uh, he very quickly formalized it and made an organization that's been a billion dollar industry. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great point. And, and this is what, this sort of goes back to my question about the, the place of writing in, in leadership. The, it seems that the the models of uh, the, the examples that we, uh, maybe this is maybe in the, in the public sphere, Steve Jobs or Lee Iacocca or um, uh, uh, Carly Fiore, the, uh, and I, I'm, there are probably a thousand people you could mention right off the top of your head, like Rick Hastings. Um, they seem to be, we seem to place them at a point where their vision is what really makes them who they are. Mm -hmm. We don't seem to see, mm -hmm maybe their daily life where they're writing very important memos or they're structuring their, their words in a certain way. We, I mean, Jobs is famous for his, um, his yearly presentation at Mac mm -hmm. World, for instance, and things like that. Is that something that, um, uh, how, would, how, would you, how would you sort of respond to that? Okay, it, it, well, one of the things that I do is I teach about how to, do, how to make a vision statement. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with this. I was dean of the College of Business mm -hmm. here for, ten, mm -hmm. for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And it it's took me about 10 years, because I had been a, a, an associate dean some other place. Uh, it took me about 10 years to, to figure out how to create a vision, because I thought, I don't have any you know, uh, crystal ball to tell me what the future is. <laughs> right. So then I learned how to create a vision um, a system for creating a vision statement. Mm -hmm. It was the same thing we just talked about. You brainstorm ideas about the future, you write them as if they're currently true. That's interesting. So you say, for example, we are uh, respected worldwide. Yeah. We uh, have highly uh, satisfied students. We, we are well compensated for our efforts. Right. Uh, we treat each other with respect and dignity. We celebrate diversity. And these are all s statements that may or They're may kind not of be like true. We want to be. Or well, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. what it is. You, and so you get people to brainstorm right. these in small groups. Mm -hmm. And then you get the groups together. And then they write down their brainstorms. And mm -hmm. they put them together. And then you have somebody wordsmith into a vision statement. And then you go back and you ask everybody how many people support this sentence, this sentence, and so on. 
And we even used a, a faculty retreat where people would vote electronically, A, B, C, D. You know, do I really like it? Do I not so like it? Right. Do so I really hate it? Sort of. So we get, and then we'd have an immediate bar graph show out on a, on a screen showing to what degree <laughs> that sentence was popular or unpopular. Yes, and then right, we'd yeah. edit it based on that. So we got right. lots and lots of uh, what they call buy-in well, or proved support. Well, you buy-in, you could, right. Yeah, we got support yeah. immediately from people because we said, okay, if it's not popular, we're gonna take that out of the vision statement. Mm -hmm. And we ended up with a vision statement that really worked and then, in this particular case, we used it for several years and it seemed to work well for us. Yeah, yeah. So it has to start with a vision. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it problematic in a business sense to, to go back and change what you've decided to do? Uh, yes. Sure I, I mean, in terms of this decisiveness, we've we've mm -hmm. come to we've we've got buy-in. We want to move forward now. It it strikes me that it could be problematic to say, okay, wait a minute. I think we have to change this. But on the other hand, see, I'm confused about this. Right. On the other hand, there is there must be a way to have a, a feedback loop that can sort of move you, keep moving forward as you as you go ahead with. I'll give your you plan. a specific case. Um, Microsoft, Bill Gates at one point decided that he did not want to get involved in internet software. He said that's just not where we're going right. with our future. Okay. And he made this pronouncement, it was in the Wall Street Journal, it was all over the world. And then Steve Ballmer, who's now the CEO, who was at that time the COO, the Chief Operating Officer, okay. he went yeah. to, to Bill Gates and he said, you know, here's all the graphs about where the, where the internet is going in terms of uh, growth, exponential growth and so on. He said. Here's what I have charted out as a potential for profit for us. And he actually got Bill Gates to reverse himself. And now if you go on your computer, it will always say msn.com on there. That's Microsoft Network, that's mm -hmm. software. Now they have Bing that's just come out in the last week or two that's on your screen, uh, unless you have an Apple. No, I've been seeing Bing. Yeah, I've been seeing is, Bing and wondering why, to tell you the truth. That's because Microsoft now has a counterpart to Google so that they can be a search engine as well. Interesting. All of this came because one guy, Steve Ballmer, went to Bill Gates and said, here's what we are gonna miss, is called opportunity right. costs in business. Yeah, right. Here's what we're missing out if we don't latch onto that rising star. Yeah. And so Bill Gates reversed himself, and I think this is one reason why he's so successful. Yeah, he can think. He can right. think. Oh, so he realizes what what he's got to do to make it. Now change. the opposite of that is the guy who just took over as uh, head of Toyota, and he said, you know, we've had the biggest losses that we've had in the career, uh, history of our company in the mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. He said we were too focused on trying to become the biggest. He said now we're going to focus on each and every car, each and every customer, being the ve very best that we can make it, and we think that's the way to become the biggest is by doing it very well every single time. I see. And yeah. so he's trying to change what's already a very what's good company. What's already been kind of the vision, the ongoing yeah, vision. and they sort of lost, lost ground. Right, right. Um, I wanted to ask you about these uh, communication strategies in the organization and the workplace, which you've worked a lot in. Um, and I think maybe you've touched on this before. You mentioned at one point um, reading. Uh, I was kind of curious about the, the, the leaders, managers, the business owners that you work with, how important do they find, um, maybe not their own writing, but what they read? I mean, are they, do they follow a certain, are, are you surprised maybe by what they know and what, what kind of stimulates them and if they, if they re actually read a lot? Well, first of all, I started to say they read a lot, but there's actually a kind of a bell-shaped curve Mm -hmm. There's some people who probably don't read very much, mm -hmm. but I think the ones who are very good tend to be very, very well read. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy named Stephen Sample, who's the president of uh, University of Southern California, and he has written a book called The Contrarian's Guide to Leadership. And one of the things that he talks about there is you are what you read, because we can't help but be influenced by, by all that. the things that we are exposed to. Some people who never, I'll give you an example. I was having lunch with a couple yesterday, Every single thing that they quoted came from Fox News Channel. And so they have this view of the world that is, is one side. Yeah. And, and, and I've talked to another friend just two days ago who only it's watches like 
MSNBC, right. Keith Olbermann, and Keith uh, Olbermann, and Rachel, Rachel Maddow, Maddow. <laughs> Chris Matthews, and The Ed Show. So every single night, it got four hours of bashing everything right wing yeah. and promoting yeah. everything left wing. This other couple yesterday is watching everything right wing and never exposing themselves to anything left wing. Right. Well, I kind of like to see both sides because I think each side has something to offer. Yeah. So therefore, you are what you read. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that can be true. Do you find that many um, many people read? They don't uh, maybe not read for their field. I mean, their their business. They don't read business. They read novels. They read poetry. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. read. Uh, you know, the, the, the arts that kind of gives them ideas. And that's fine too because mm -hmm. that's part of what we know. One of the things I teach is the innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. And to give you an example there, uh, there were some people that were trying to develop a weapon system for the uh, military. This is years ago. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, a consultant took them out on a desert and they said, let's do this desert excursion just to see if there's anything in nature, <laughs> anything in nature that might somehow give us an idea. So one of the things they observed was this rattlesnake going along the sand uh, looking for a mouse or something like that to eat. And they came on this idea, it was a sidewinder rattlesnake. From that they came up with a heat-seeking missile which mm -hmm. they later called the sidewinder missile. Yes, right. And they got this completely un uh, unrelated idea but came, but from, came nature. from nature. And so whether it's with your kayaking or whether you're reading poetry or whether you're just dreaming or daydreaming. Right. Um, there are all ways that we can get ideas and sometimes the incubation stage is when most of the ideas hatch. Yeah. Do you, um, do you have a favorite word that you like to use or that, or that you've come across recently that you think you might, uh, wow. might put into? Well, first of all, let me just say I'm, a fas I'm fascinated with words. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in the whole field of general semantics. Mm. and. Um, that's a hard one for me to focus on an individual right. word. I yeah. can give you a few. Well, a few one of my or favorites an idea. is supportiveness. Mm -hmm. Because the research on leadership is that if we feel down deeply that our boss is supportive of us and that we make mistakes and they uh, forgive, right. yeah. that, that they're on our side, then that goes a long, long way to boosting the productivity so that the task and the people are in concert with one another, yeah. not competing. On the other hand, if we, if I feel like you're my boss and I have to really be careful because if I say the wrong word or, uh, you know, you'll you'll just jump on me for any little <laughs> infraction, then I'm going to be less productive because I'm going to be so careful. I won't want to say the wrong thing. We'll see how that destroys that creative brainstorming, yeah. that free flowing, uh, unorganization or unconference, that kind of thing. The, the one is very much thriving on flexibility and freedom and the other is stifled by um, the criticism. So yeah. supportiveness is the one most significant thing that I could d teach about leadership. Yeah. But I, I sometimes, interesting. for years, I used to cut up little squares of velvet and on the last day of class I'd give each person a little square of velvet and I'd say, put this in your wallet or your purse and remember just to touch this from time to time and remember the secret of leadership is this velvet touch. Nice. That's what supportiveness right, is. It's, right. a, it's, it's a metaphor for supportiveness. Well, it's, you've touched on so many interesting issues because I, I like the way you put things in terms of these continuums, like the coaching and the counseling, um, or the you know uh, decisive versus the malleable or something. Yes. Because th there are times when you really have to say, you know, the eyes have the it eyes and I'm the it. eye. <laughs> uh, um, it must be tough for a uh, an emerging leader or somebody even maybe with a, a lot of experience to be able to say want to be decisive or maybe even autocratic and at the same time supportive of people who are more uh, the flexible type or the imaginary type. Mm -hmm. I know you have to have sort of visionary thinkers who might have a hard time getting things down on paper right. and or they have a place in an organization, I, I hope. <laughs> anyway. Well, here's the thing. Again, <laughs> it goes back to situational leadership. The, the, the theory is that you start off with the structure. Right. Everybody needs to know what do you expect of me. And then th as we work through to a different part of our, uh, what's called our readiness, mm -hmm. you know, at some, when we start off in an organization, we have a low level of readiness to accept more freedom. And as we gain more and more readiness, we are more capable of handling the freedom. 
And the, I'll give you an example. I was an MBA director at another university, mm -hmm. and I had a young lady who was my graduate assistant in the first semester. And I tend to have a very hands-off style, see? And so um, we did a survey. We were going to revi revise the MBA curriculum, and we had a survey for the alumni and a survey for the current students. Say, well, let's see what you think about what we've been doing, and then we'll talk about where we need to go next right. based on that feedback. Right. Well, because I had such a hands-off approach, didn't give her enough of the coaching, she ended up sending the wrong survey to the wrong group. So the current students got the alumni survey, okay. and the alumni got the current wasn't students survey. Wasn't really tuning in as well. It wasn't her fault, it was my fault. Oh, see, yeah. I didn't give her, I gave her too much flexibility for her needs. Yes. Her readiness level required more direction. Right. And so that's the real uh, trick of leadership, the gift of leadership is to know wanting. how to diagnose. Yeah, and I use a medical model as an example. Mm -hmm. If you don't diagnose that cardiac issue or whatever, properly, then all the treatment in the world is not going to do the, do the trick. Right. So it's the same with leadership. If you don't diagnose the readiness level of your person that you're trying to influence, then you're going to probably miss the mark. Right. Well, I like where we've come to. I think <laughs> this is a good, a good place to kind of uh, uh, pull it together or, or, or um, wrap it up, I guess, so to speak, because uh, we did talk about writing and we talked a lot about leadership, and I want to thank you for, for coming. And uh, I've, I've got a nice, very much different picture of how, <laughs> of how kind of the, the, um, the leadership nexus works, so to yes. speak. The, and the, that's the, why the I write. That's why that's I why write, you write. Is because I try to get this word out to as many people as I can. And I can Fantastic. only have so many people in the room at a time. Right. You always came full circle. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, Randy. My guest has been Dr. Stuart Tubbs of the Eastern Michigan University Business School. And I want to thank him for being here once again. And I want to thank you for coming to uh, witness our show. My name is Randall Beyer, your host. And stay tuned for yet another um, installation of Why We Write.